welcome everybody, and uh, uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to um, have you here for what I think is going to be a really interesting and enormously important discussion. Um, my name is Jessica Matthews. Um, I'm the former president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and now a distinguished fellow there. Um, it's my honor to, uh, to serve as your moderator today. I want to thank the Chicago Council on Global Affairs and the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft for partnering in putting this event together. Um, as always with Chicago Council events, uh, speakers are uh, voicing their own opinions and don't speak um, of, for uh, institutional positions. Tonight's format is, uh, is going to be a, a quick debate and also time for questions from the audience, but I'm going to ask a series of questions. Um, we, will, we will go back and forth between the two speakers. They'll have about two and a half minutes to answer and then a quick rebuttal if they want to. Um, and then we will, we will move to questions from the audience. Let me, um, let me start by introducing them. On my near left is George Beebe who is the Director of Grand Strategy at the Quincy Institute. He has spent more than two decades in government as an intelligence analyst, a diplomat, a policy advisor, um, in, including time um, as head of the Open Source Institute at the CIA and, uh, and chief Russian analyst at the agency. Uh, he also served as a staff advisor to Vice President Cheney. Evo Dalder, I think everyone in the audience knows, is the president of the Chicago Council. Uh, he served in government on um, uh, more than one occasion, but in, importantly as U.S. Ambassador to NATO from 2009 to 2013, um, and also served as um, principal uh, director for European affairs in Bill Clinton's National Security Council in the late 90s. So please join me in welcoming our distinguished experts. And my, my first question is going to go to, uh, to George. Um, if this is uh, where we are now, roughly the end of the beginning, can you kind of summarize for us in, in bullet form um, what's happened? What, what has happened to, to Russia? What has happened to Ukraine? at the at the 10,000 foot level? Well, I think it's a very bad news story. Um, what's happened to Russia is it's essentially alienated itself uh, from the West and alienated the West in quite a profound way that I think will have very long term implications for Russia's development economically, politically, societally. Um, what Putin did on uh, February 24th, 2022, was make a decision that essentially closed the door to any kind of a normal relationship uh, with the United States and Europe for a long time to come. And it, it's going to, I think, lead to a, a Russia that is a lot more uh, uh, unintegrated into the world, uh, particularly with the West, much more dependent on China, uh, much more focus on what's called the Global South uh, for a lot of its uh, political, economic, and, and diplomatic engagement. Uh, and that's going to sp uh, spell, I think, um, a, a much uh, slower growth for Russia over time uh, economically and uh, some political hard times. Uh, Ukraine, I think, is also in a very difficult situation. Uh, Ukraine is bearing the brunt of this war, without question. Um, and uh, you know, looking at the economy, um, most estimates indicate that the Ukrainian economy has plunged by more than 30% since this war began. That's uh, difficult for us to imagine. That sounds just like a number. That is a, a, a profoundly a uh, damaging situation to go through. And that uh, uh, economic plunge is going to continue over time. Uh, they've lost population. Something close to 10 million people have uh, left the country, at least temporarily. Many of those are not going to come back. That has big implications for Ukraine over time. A lot of the people that have left are 
uh, the youngest uh, people, the, the people that have the most uh, economic uh, potential, people that uh, are the foundations of a society over time. That's going to have a, a long-term implication for Ukraine. And on top of that, Ukraine's bearing the brunt of the destruction. This is war being fought on Ukrainian territory. Its infrastructure is being damaged. Its cities are being damaged. Right. That has big implications. But I will add here that it's not just uh, Ukraine and Russia that are suffering under this. Uh, Europe and the world are profoundly being affected by this. Europe can't really, under these circumstances, look forward to any kind of a normal relationship with Russia. That means that Europe is going to be divided uh, in ways that I would argue are even worse than what happened during the Cold War when we had the so-called Iron Curtain uh, separating East from West, NATO and the Warsaw Pact, the Soviet Union uh, and the United States. That was, for much of the Cold War, a division that had rules. There was uh, an understanding, despite the ideological differences, despite the military standoff between NATO and the Warsaw Pact, there was an understanding about what was inbounds, what was out of bounds, where the red lines were drawn. We don't have that. No. Europe is looking f uh, toward a future which is quite volatile, uh, where we're going to be on the precipice of conflict for a long time to come without the rules to govern that and to help mitigate the dangers that it will spin out of control. So this war, I think, is having profoundly negative consequences for everybody involved. So, Ivo, on top of all that. <laughs> what? I mean, I'm not going to repeat all the bad news that, 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 that George lays out, and I agree with that is all the bad news. And there is, this is a bad news story, but it's also not necessarily only bad news story. Um, I mean, the bad news is that a lot of people are suffering in a way that people in Europe haven't suffered since 1945. We have a major, major war for the first time, really, since 1945 on the European continent, a war of imperialism, uh, a war in which one side has decided that uh, they want to take the territory and control the political uh, governance of another yeah. state. A fundamental violation of everything that uh, international affairs and the rule of law stands for, uh, that the Soviet Union, as a signatory of um, the UN Charter, agreed was uh, something that could not and should not stand. By the way, the Soviet Union and Russia reiterated that the idea of using force to change borders was just not acceptable. And all of the consequences come from that. The problem from Russia's perspective, which may not necessarily be a terrible thing from our perspective, is that they completely miscalculated. They thought this war would be over quickly, they would be able to have Ukrainian control, uh, control over Ukraine. And in fact, what has happened is that Russia has suffered grievously. Uh, most of its army is involved in a war where they can move inches, meters, maybe a kilometer, but nothing like uh, the way they need to move uh, in order to, to exact uh, control, not just of Ukraine, but frankly of the territory that they have uh, annexed, which they cannot militarily achieve. They have isolated themselves politically. They have become economically devastated. John McCain used to say that this was a country that was a, a petrol station with nuclear weapons. Well, it's no longer much of a petrol station. It still has nuclear weapons, which is something we have to be very concerned about. I think George is right on Ukraine and the, the damage it has done, but it has done other things. Ukraine now is a nation with an identity. Thanks to Vladimir Putin, a nation that didn't have an identity as much, or certainly where a national Ukrainian identity wasn't as strong since 2014, and really since 2022, has become a nation that actually feels uh, at its core uh, that it needs to stick together, in which people of all sides and all uh, parts of society are coming together in order to deal with it. And then finally, on the West, um, uh, I, I agree that there are rules that, that are no longer governing the structure. But I'd rather be on the current Western side of that divide than on the other side. 
right. a stronger NATO that has become larger uh, as a result of this, united in its conviction that, that this cannot stand, that has done extraordinary things, cut itself off from Russian gas uh, and Russian uh, uh, energy exports, and in many other ways has become stronger, more independent, and more capable uh, of, of acting. Now, it may not act wisely at all times, um, but again, if you have to be in, in, in one of the two sides, this is the side I'd rather be on. And who two years ago would have predicted uh, that the Europeans would stand uh, together in the way they have stood yeah. together? So in, above the kind of day-to-day -day who's attacked what city today, and, and uh, uh, this has been a year of, of an extraordinary strategic, big strategic impacts on both sides. Um, so looking ahead, um, there are broadly kind of three final outcomes. Ukraine wins, Russia wins, there's a stalemate. Um, there are different paths how one might get there. Um, and um, uh, I think we should, we should turn to thinking about um, what the war looks like going ahead. Um, it looks to be, um, and now I'm, I may be trespassing on, on your views here, but it looks to be like a war of attrition um, in which uh, it's uh, morale on one side versus material on the other, and which one um, holds out better. Talk a bit, I think, Evo, you go first here about how you see the, the outlook looking ahead for the war itself? So we know one thing, which is that Russia has lost. They have whatever it is that ends up in the end of the war, we know that the cost to Russia, not just in human lives, 200,000 plus killed and wounded, probably 50,000 of those killed. By the way, uh, the Soviet Union suffered in Afghanistan 15,000 casualties in 10 years of war. And that was enough to turn much of the population against uh, its own system. We are now well beyond it, 10 times uh, beyond that in, in this particular war. Uh, Russia will not achieve militarily what it set out to achieve. It won't uh, be able to annex the territories, uh, to control the territories that it has illegally annexed. Uh, and Vladimir Putin has come out of this a much weaker uh, leader of a much weaker country. So we know that. Then the question is, what else do we know? Uh, how is it possible for Ukraine actually to win? Because you can lose, and both sides can lose. And here, it really, uh, the question on, on winning is not just of materiel and morale, which clearly on the morale side, the, the Ukrainians still have the advantage of the morale, given that they're defending their own territory against uh, a country that is that has not only invaded them but is 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 trying to take that territory away. Um, the material is limited. It's limited by the fact that the production capability inside Ukraine doesn't exist, um, and it is limited by what the Western countries are able and willing uh, to provide uh, the Ukrainians. So far, they have been able and willing to give an awful an awful lot. Uh, sufficient probably for a major offensive military operation that will happen uh, in the next uh, few months or will start sometime uh, in the next few months. That offensive may achieve significant military uh, uh, advantage as we've seen Ukrainians do last uh, September and, and since. Um, but it is unlikely to end up with Ukraine recapturing all of the territory uh, that is Ukrainian and that Russia has been occupying since 2014 and extended since 2024. And until they have complete control of their territory, both, at least the Ukrainians are going to say, we need to be able to be in a position to, to reacquire that territory by military means, and the Russians will resist and therefore are likely to have um, a war of, a standoff, a, a war of attrition. Probably not at the lines they are today, but somewhere else. And that standoff is going to be determined by who, over time, will have sufficient capability to change the military status quo. 
I think neither side is likely to have that for many, many years. And that you will be in a situation where this conflict and the line of conflict may move back and forth, but that you are back to uh, the situation one hopes uh, before 2014, uh, before 2024. I mean, this war has been going on now in its 10th year. Not in its yeah. second year, it's in its 10th year. Um, it's, it's been started in February of 2014 when the Russians first invaded and, and occupied and, and le- illegally annexed Crimea. Uh, this war is likely to, to go on for another five to ten years, uh, but hopefully at an intensity that is very different right. than we've seen over right. the past year. So, George, what do you think? Well, um, there's much that I agree with about that. I think the Russians certainly have failed to achieve at least one of their big objectives uh, at the beginning of, of this invasion, uh, and that is to capture Kiev and to, uh, to resubjugate Ukraine, to turn Ukraine into essentially uh, a, a subordinate uh, to Russia. And uh, that failed spectacularly. Uh, Putin attempted uh, to, uh, to take Kiev to replace the Zelensky government. Uh, that was a poorly planned operation and it uh, essentially blew up in his face. Uh, and I don't think there's any way that the Russians uh, can realistically aspire to capturing uh, Kiev or controlling the vast bulk of Ukrainian territory. Whatever happens uh, from this point on in the war, Russia is not going to be planting its flag in Kiev. Uh, That said, I think it's premature to say that the Russians have lost this war altogether, or that there aren't other strategic objectives that they're still not capable of achieving. Uh, One of which, I think, is to prevent Ukraine from being a part of the NATO military alliance or being an outpost of the U.S. military in some significant way. That's an objective that I think uh, was one of Putin's top priorities at the beginning of this invasion, and it remains something that I think is realistic for Russia to aspire to. Now, why do I think that? Uh, I don't think Russia has to actually win this war on the ground to achieve that objective. You can prevent Ukraine from being a part of the NATO alliance or being a U.S. military objective merely by wrecking it, not by conquering it. And I think conquering it is beyond Putin's capability, but wrecking it, I think, remains something that, that Russia is capable of doing. Um, And I think it's a very serious danger, and the United States and West, I don't believe, have a strategy for preventing that. The longer this war goes on, the more Ukraine is destroyed, the more it loses manpower, the more difficulty it will have in reconstituting itself as an effective functioning state. So uh, that is an outcome that I think is realistic, and it goes beyond just stalemate because you can achieve that objective even if the sides are not moving the front lines on the map all that significantly. Uh-huh. Do you, Eva, you want to do a yeah. quick rebuttal? Because, yes, I think that's a certainly a possibility, and we are now in the realm not of positive uh, effort on the Russians, but a negative effort on the Russians, and I think uh, with regard to Ukraine. Uh, I, I'm skeptical uh, that um, they will succeed. Uh, in, in the destructive nature of this form. There is now more serious debate inside the United States government as well as among allies about what the future security relationship is with Ukraine than we've had since any time since 1991. Ukraine has been independent. We will have a major debate about this at the NATO summit in Vilnius. Uh, we're not ready to move towards thinking about the next step in terms of NATO membership, but there is a lot of serious thought being given to how do you create a security arrangement with Ukraine that is fundamentally different than in the past, uh, with more weapons, more capabilities, more, more a relationship not unlike the United States has with Israel, uh, in which there is a guarantee of military capabilities and supplies to Ukraine uh, over the longer term. Uh, I think there is an increasing serious thought being given about how do you dissuade uh, Russia from, provide, from continuing to inflict this incredible damage on civilian infrastructure and on cities uh, that we have, uh, we have seen with long-range missiles, not only through defensive means, 
but perhaps more for deterrence and offensive means. So I'm, I, I think we can't take what is happening today as the status quo. Uh, I think there's a more serious effort to say Ukraine deserves to be part of the West for what it has done so, uh, um, and is willing to take steps to make that happen. So if we shift to the question of possible diplomatic solutions or diplomatic outcomes, I mean, we're just remind the audience that Russia has twice formally guaranteed Ukraine's sovereignty. Once in, as the Soviet Union uh, collapsed and, and Ukraine was given an independent seat at the UN. And then a few years later in 1994, when Ukraine acceded to the Non-Proliferation Treaty and Russia, the US and Great Britain signed what's known as the Budapest Memorandum in which Russia formally recognized Ukraine's borders uh, and eschewed any threat to them in the future. So the question then becomes, is any Russian um, uh, commitment to Ukraine's future got any credibility absent uh, Ukraine's membership in, the U in NATO? Um, would um, membership in the EU do? Um, we're, we're, how do we get from the current situation to some kind of a diplomatic uh, solution, which is, after all, how nearly every war ends um, uh, from, from where we are now? And uh, George, you're up first on that. Well, you know, um, the answer to that question, I think, depends on how you're framing what this conflict is about. A lot of people look at this war as primarily a conflict over territory, that this is a war driven by Putin's imperialistic ambitions, that he looked at Ukraine as an illegitimate state, one that has no right to exist, one that was occupying territory that is rightfully Russian's, uh, and as a result, he's attempted to acquire that territory by force. If you look at it through that prism, then this really is a question of, can Ukraine and Russia compromise over territory? And I think the answer to that is, the prospects for that kind of compromise are very dim right now. Uh, neither side is inclined to make concessions. Putin has formally annexed large portions of Ukraine. By Russian law, he can't simply negotiate that away, nor does he have any intention of doing so. Uh, and uh, on the Ukrainian side, I think it's quite clear that uh, Zelensky uh, is in no mood to bargain away territory, and there is no support for that within the Ukrainian population as a whole. So how then do you get to a diplomatic solution? I think the answer is, if that's the way you're framing it, we're going to be at war for a long, long time. And the suffering that we've talked about all, already is, is going to intensify over that period. But there's another way of framing this war, which I think is important, because it's an, it's an important uh, aspect of this conflict. And that is geostrategic. It's the question of whether uh, Russia is willing to live with a Ukraine that is a military outpost of the United States. And through Russian eyes, poses uh, a threat, and Russians would say an existential threat, uh, to Russia's national security. That is an issue that the Russians have been raising with the United States and the West for decades. This is not a new issue. Uh, it, it remains the, the most important demand that the Russians have on that. And it is one that the United States has refused to discuss at all. Now, I think the way the Russians have pursued this has been very counterproductive, inexcusable, clearly illegal, a violation of the UN Charter. But nonetheless, if we're going to find our way out of this war, talking about that issue, finding some way of addressing Ukraine's uh, legitimate security concerns, America's and, Europea and Europe's legitimate security concerns, and also finding a way to address Russian concerns is necessary. Now, when the, the Russians were building up uh, their invasion force opposite Ukraine, 
late last year. Uh, President Biden and President Putin had uh, a virtual summit meeting uh, where they talked about this issue. And President Biden, uh, if we can trust what he had to tell us after that meeting, said, this is not an issue we're willing to talk about. We'll talk about arms control. We can talk about various confidence and security building measures. But Ukraine's potential membership in NATO is not open for discussion. He stood on the White House lawn and said, I don't recognize anybody's red lines. Now, unless we are willing to address that, I don't think there are prospects for a negotiated settlement to this war. But if we are, if we're willing to talk about that, how do we address that issue? Then I think uh, the territorial issue might be able to be kicked down the road and that's something that the Ukrainians uh, in March of last year, after this war began, they had proposed tabling that question of territory for a 10 year period uh, before really getting serious about some sort of compromise. If we can find a compromise on that geostrategic issue, then I think there's a possibility we can put the territorial issue aside and in the meantime, uh, bring this conflict under control. So that would be my, right. my no, answer right. to how do we deal with this diplomatically. Thank you. Eva. So George has helped me uh, in setting up the stage because I'm clearly in the first camp of people why we have this, this, this conflict, uh, which is that we have a conflict because one power has decided to wage a imperial war against another power and is doing so because it doesn't recognize the reality that Ukraine is independent. Uh, and, 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 and a viable state and has been independent and as Jessica said, legally recognized as such by not just the Soviet Union, but by Russia. Um, uh, and, and, and as such, as you said, violated uh, the UN Security Council. Um, uh, the UN, UN Security, uh, the UN Charter. I don't actually think the issue is territory. I don't think the Ukrainians, the issue is per se territory. It's not about every inch. It's about the principle of territory, but not necessarily about how you control it. After all, it's the Ukrainians who said, let's postpone the territorial discussion. And by the way, and we're willing not to be members of NATO. Uh, and it was the Russians who denied that. I, 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 who, who, who walked away from that, uh, that discussion. But, well, more, that, but, more, but more important, more important, I don't think we're in a realm where a Ukraine can ever trust Russia. Certainly not this Russia with this regime for anything that we're talking about. And so Ukraine will have to find a security somewhere. Else. And it is finding a security today by finding a, fighting a war for its own survival. And it tomorrow wants to make sure that that whatever gain it has, it will be guaranteed. And we will find very soon that Ukraine, in fact, it already has made that very clear, will reach the same conclusion that the Swedes reached after 200 years of neutrality, and the Finns reached after 100 years of neutrality, that your security is better guaranteed by being a member of an alliance that actually is very good at guaranteeing the security uh, of your territory than it is to rely on the benevolence of your neighbor. And Russia will have to come under to understand a very simple concept that its security depends on the security of its neighbors. The more secure your neighbors are, the more secure you are. And the United States is the living exemplification of that. We have extraordinarily secure neighbors, not because we can't occupy them, but we have no desire to occupy them. And as a result, security at the border between the United States and its two uh, regions is very different. We don't have armies there. Yes, we have immigration issues, etc. but it's a very different issue. Um, and so perhaps if Russia were to understand that it poses a threat to the security of others and that that's at the core of the problem, we might get to a situation in which territory will be resolved as well. Quickly. Very quick uh, factual point. Um, Ukraine did in fact in, in March of last year,
uh, through Turkish mediation, put mm -hmm. a proposal on the table that tabled the territorial issue and proposed uh, geostrategic neutrality uh, that Ukraine would not become a member of NATO. It was not the Russians that rejected it. The Ukrainians pulled away from the, the negotiations, citing uh, the massacre at Bucha as their reason for doing so. Uh, the Russians, in fact, thought that that was a very sound basis for a, a deal and have not rejected those terms. So, if I may, um, I agree with both of you. <laughs> I, I mean, the Russians have, throughout several hundred years of history, been obsessed with the notion of strategic depth. Um, uh, Catherine the Great said that the only way she knew to protect her borders um, uh, was to expand, expand them. Um, and and th what this war has done is to create right on Russia's doorstep a country that is now vastly more militarily efficient, that is a, virtually a, a military ward of the United States, and where it's very hard to imagine a solution, a diplomatic solution that conveys confidence um, to Ukraine that the Russians won't violate it again. Um, uh, for, for reasons that we can understand that go way, way back in its history um, at, through Napoleon and, uh, uh, and Hitler. Um, before we turn I'd like to just give you each a chance um, to say very quickly, what worries you the most about the next year or two? Um, what are the wild cards that, that could throw this thing off whatever path you each imagine going forward? So uh, let me, uh, I mean, I worry more, most about the potential of escalation and the use of nuclear weapons uh, by Russia. But let me put it in a, in, a, in a slightly larger framework. What I worry most is about a rogue Russia. A Russia that has, that has come to the conclusion it has nothing to lose. Or a leadership in Russia that has concluded that it has nothing to lose. One of which means it makes it easier to think about doing the unthinkable, uh, which is to use nuclear weapons. But it's beyond that. Um, this is a country that has thrown out of the window in a very fundamental sense, the idea of how nations need to interact with each other um, in a way that we haven't seen in, in, in a long time. Um, that's number one. Number two, this is a country that goes around and, and, and poisons its enemies around the world, um, citizens of its own nation, people who have either defected or have the temerity to oppose the government. And it's that rogue action that uh, I worry about. There's, no, there's, no, there's none of the systematic engagement. We don't talk to each other anymore, in which we did during the Cold War. Uh, and, and, and as Jim Baker so famously said, you never talk to your friends, you need to talk to your enemies. And I'm a big believer in there's no one you shouldn't be talking to. Uh, and the lack of conversation that we have that you know, ended the Cuban Missile Crisis was conversation, was, was talking to each other. That also means that people live in this world where they think they can get away and do anything they want. And I do think, I don't think Vladimir Putin is sick. I don't think he is irrational, um, but I do think he is unconstrained. And I worry about him thinking that he can get away with murder, which is what he is engaged in, by the way, today, uh, as we speak. Um, Alexei Navalny is, is once again poisoned in, in prison. Uh, and uh, not doing well. Other of his people are being put in jail for the temerity of having said something that opposes the government uh, so, for 25 years. Well, That's what I worry about. Okay, George, quickly, because we have a whole lot of questions here. Well, I think by far the most significant uh, national security interest that the United States has is preventing uh, a nuclear war between itself and Russia or China. Uh, that is the biggest thing that threatens the existence of our country. It is absolutely vital that we preclude that kind of situation. Things about how Russia treats its domestic political opponents are certainly important issues. 
but they don't even come close to threatening the lives and the security of our country. Um, so I think we have to keep foremost in mind that priority issue. What worries me is not that Putin is going to wake up and say, hey, I'd like to have a nuclear war with the United States. Uh, clearly, he does not want that. That's a bad thing for Russia as well as for us. But we could get into an escalation spiral in which one of the other countries faces exactly the situation that John F. Kennedy warned about in the wake of the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is a choice between national humiliation and nuclear use. It's easy for me to envision a situation in which either the United States or Russia faces that kind of choice, given how close we are to a direct conflict in Ukraine. And I can spin out how those scenarios might play out, but they're unfortunately all too imaginable in this situation. And that does, in fact, yeah. worry me a great deal. Okay, let's, um, uh, I have a lot of questions online. And a lot of questions here. So let's let's turn first to. Thank you. I I can't. This, this is Janice Ginsler, former teacher of Russian in Morgan Park High School, uh, and studied at Moscow State University. Um, my question, and, and I, uh, the Chicago Public Schools sent me with ten students to this former Soviet Union for three weeks. We ended up in Kiev. <laughs> so I have friends in Kiev. I have friends in Russia that I communicate with. Um, and uh, I've had a going concern with my friend in Kiev. Uh, she's a journalist, a featured journalist, uh, about NATO. I think NATO is the elephant in the room. And I know you were uh, a representative to NATO. Um, and if the Warsaw Pact went away in 1991, when the Soviet Union went away, why didn't NATO go away? Um, I think NATO okay. has let, to go away. Let me away. stop you there and give Evo a chance to answer. So I think we learned a lesson. The United States and NATO in the run up to this war said two things. Ukraine is not a member, therefore we will not defend it. NATO territory, every inch of NATO territory will be defended. The logical conclusion was that if Russia attacked Ukraine, NATO would not intervene. Didn't, it provides weapons, provides intelligence, but it doesn't actually intervene. And that if only NATO had, Ukraine had been a member of NATO, they wouldn't have attacked. That was the conclusion that Finland reached after 100 years of neut neutrality. That was the conclusion that Sweden reached after 200 years of neutrality, and other European countries are now saying, maybe actually being a member of an alliance that says we will defend you if you are attacked, will act to deter people like Vladimir Putin who want to take other people's territory by force. So the elephant in the room, in this case, I think maybe the absence of NATO rather than its presence. Okay, I, what I would like to do, if I could, and you guys have notepads, right? Is take three questions here and, and, and give you then a chance to, but so that we get through some more of th in our tight time. So, sir. Thank you. So uh, Vladimir Putin provides a sort of stability right now in Russia, but someday he won't be the leader of Russia. He's mortal. How do you see the last year as changing the, the landscape there and the eventual transition of power in, in Russia. Question. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Art Fransek uh, from Peace Corps One, Russia, 1992. Uh, my question is about the Global South. I would look at and say the Global South and unaligned countries would represent a majority of the world's population and also a majority of the world's GDP and are helping Russia to circumvent sanctions on financial and oil controls that are trying to be imposed by the EU, EU and the US. Can you comment on that? I ask all of you to see if that's an issue there. That the, Are the sanctions effective given that the uh, Global South is making money on them to a, to a certain extent. Thank you. Thank you. And let's take one more, and then I'll turn to our speaker. 
Um, yeah, my question is slightly longer in nature. I'll try to make it succinct. Um, my question is this. Uh, there's no doubt that China is our biggest uh, geopolitical rival. And among their actions, they're trying to replace the dollar as the international currency. Um, and they're trying to be the broker of peace in Ukraine. And my question is this. Um, could the delivery of F-16s uh, and other such aircraft to Ukraine be a method of forcing China's hand on the international st stage and showing its true partisan nature? Especially given the recent intel leak that F's, uh, one of China's red lines is that, um, according to our analysts, is that um, either China would become actively involved in the war in supporting Russia if either one, Russia continued losing the war in a significant way, or two, um, Ukraine gain the capacity and willingness to strike deep within Russia. Uh, oh, thank you. Okay, thanks. All right, George. Okay, um, very quick response on NATO. Um, there was a debate inside the US government back in the mid 1990s over what to do in Europe. Warsaw Pact went away, NATO was then 16 nations. What about those states in between Russia and NATO? How to provide for their you know, quite legitimate security concerns. Um, one of the camps in the debate in the United States said, well, you expand NATO. The other one said, well, no, that, that could be problematic. That could uh, kick off what you might call the security dilemma in international relations theory, where things that we thought were defensive were perceived as aggressive and threatening by the Russians. So the other party said, we, we expand what was then called the Partnership for Peace. It was a, a way of increasing military and security cooperation with these in-between states, for lack of a better term, that wouldn't threaten uh, Russia, uh, where Russia wouldn't feel it was on the outside, the object of, and, and opponent of NATO. Um, the P4P group lost that debate. And I, I think that's one I wish we had a do-over on. Um, Post-Putin, I think one of the big uh, things that's happening inside Russia is the extreme right, the nationalist patriot uh, part of the Russian political spectrum, which has long thought that Putin is too soft, too willing to seek compromises and rapprochement with the West, too eager to pursue the Minsk II Accords in Ukraine as a solution to the war, even though the West wasn't sincere in actually trying to implement that. Um, that uh, part of the political spectrum is growing bigger and stronger, more influential over time. And they're growing quite critical of how Putin has conducted this war. They think he's been too soft, too unwilling to use Russia's uh, military capabilities to their full extent. So uh, clearly there is going to be a post-Putin Russia. Right now I'm worried that the, the trends inside Russia are such that um, the most likely successor is going to come out of that part of the political spectrum. I think okay. that's very bad news for the United States. Let me give Evo, can you, would you start by addressing the Global South issue and then any addition? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I agree on the Russia issue exactly the same way. I think uh, if you like Putin, you'll love what comes after. Um, uh, on the, I mean, the Global South, I think it's a, it's a, very, in, it's a very important issue. I, I think it's wrong to think that the Global South is aligning with Russia, but it is aligned against the war. It sees the war as a real problem, uh, and rightly so, because of higher fuel and fuel prices and the consequences are direct. There are a number of actors that are benefiting significantly from the war. The Chinese and the Indians uh, have never been able to buy oil as cheaply as they can buy it now. Uh, thank you very much. And the Saudis are cranking up the oil price by pumping less uh, uh, as a result. And they are trying to evade sanctions. Uh, and it, to some extent are undermining the capacity of the sanctions to do their, uh, their damage. But the sanctions are damaging in a very significant way. Uh, and, and in particular, the export controls that are making it very difficult for the Russians to get the kind of technology they need in order to sustain a modern military. They're taking out uh, T-60s, which are now uh, tanks from the 1960s, uh, and they're trying to refurbish them because they just can't produce the kind of equipment uh, that they used to be able to produce. 
uh, uh, F-16s in China, let me, uh, I think the larger question here, will China come to the direct assistance of, uh, um, of Russia? Uh, my view is that uh, I think that is exceedingly unlikely. Um, they want to help Russia, but not to the extent that they will, are seen openly to do so with the kinds of military capabilities that they really would, uh, and, and the quantities of military capabilities they need to send in order to have a real impact strategically uh, on the situation. Um, I think the U.S. called the, Russian, the, the Chinese out because they were trying to help um, the, uh, the, the Russians uh, surreptitiously. Uh, so they didn't want to have their hands on it. If they, wanted to if they want to ship artillery shells to Russia and missiles, they can do it. I mean, it's a, there's a border there and they can run trains. There are different gauges, but uh, it's not that hard to do that or they can fly it over and ship it over and they haven't done that. Um, I think the, it, it's uh, unlikely that the Chinese will. The only, if, if you indeed get into the deep humiliation and the, the Russian regime being threatened and its existence threatened, perhaps, but under those circumstances, I worry much more about it, uh, the possibility of escalation by the Russians than I, I do about the Chinese. Let, let me ask you a couple of questions from our online audience. Um, uh, Stuart Kaplan in Chapel Hill has asked whether Ukraine could survive as an independent nation if Crimea is part of Russia. Um, or would that, or would it eventually become a Russian client state in the same way that Belarus has? Um, and, um, and also ask whether Crimea might instead be configured as an as a independent nation, perhaps with Sevastopol as a Russian enclave. Um, also, we've had a couple of questions about the private sector, which we haven't talked about here. Um, uh, whether the trillion dollars of Russian assets that are frozen in the West um, might be confis confiscated in a way that would help pay for the rebuilding of Ukraine. Um, George, you want to um, uh, take well, either one of I'll, those? I'll, I'll take the last question first. Uh, I think a trillion is a little bit of an overstatement as yeah. to exactly how much uh, Russian sovereign assets have been uh, frozen in Western banks. I think the number is somewhere around 200 to 300 billion, which is still quite a significant sum. Uh, I think the Europeans had a, an answer to that question quite recently. One of their officials said that they had in fact looked into this question as to whether we could take the, that Russian money and, and use it for reconstruction of Ukraine. And his answer was no. Uh, legally, uh, we would be way out of bounds in attempting to do that, which gets to this broader question of the so-called rules-based order. Yep. Um, if the United States is uh, going to play by the rules and convince the global south, among other uh, places in the world, that the rules apply to the United States equally as they do to, to other players in the world, then I think we have to be very sensitive to this perception that the United States is willing to bend or break the rules when we feel like it's in our interest to do so. Yeah. Uh, but we, we get to enforce what other nations have to comply with. Um, that is a perception that is widespread in the global south, and it's, it's not uh, for entirely unjustified reasons. So this is something I think we need to be thinking about very hard. Okay. Evo, is there anything you want to add on? Uh, I mean, on, on, on this question, I, I, I agree this is a tricky one. I do, I do think the Russians ought to be paying uh, in, in more than the cost that they're, cons uh, that they're suffering now for the damage that they are inflicting. But we should do it according to the rules, whatever those rules are. And if, if there are legal uh, restrictions, I think in, in, in Europe, they're still looking at this. We've looked at it in the U.S. One, there's not a lot of resources here that are being held in U.S. banks. Uh, the, the other is that the, the legal way of doing it is very, very uh, difficult. Uh, the, the other question was, oh, on Ukraine. Crimea, uh, yeah. yeah, Ukraine could certainly be an independent state without Crimea. That's, uh, in fact, I think Ukraine could be an independent state without the Donbass too. Um, uh, th that's not the point. The point is how you arrive at that. Do you do it through the use of force? Do you do it through a referendum of independence and not one that is run by the Russians after they have occupied it. Um, how you arrive at this, it has to be done in a, in a legally and a generally acceptable way. 
Uh, and if that is the end point of this war and the Ukrainians are, uh, accept that, perfectly fine. I'm, we're not going to be, I'm not going to tell them how to do that. Uh, but it is, it is for something that has to be done in a negotiation. Uh, uh, and can it happen? Yes, of course. Ukraine could be uh, independent uh, in whatever form it wants to, but it has to make that Detroit, arrive at that freely and independently. Um, we are five minutes over our proscribed, but this has been such a rich discussion that I'm going to take two more <laughs> and, um, and, and let's, uh, two more terrific questions, I hope. Uh, yes, I want to go back to talk about potentials for reconstruction. Um, I know that there are lots of efforts underway in order to get money to the Ukrainians. I know that Prime Minister uh, Shmikhal was in Washington, uh, in fact, last week, I believe, uh, in order to solicit funds to help with that. And the Ukrainians would like to get that uh, underway as soon as possible. Um, my question is whether or not you believe the West can sustain most of the funds that are going to be needed, or if uh, perhaps other nations such as the Chinese are going to have to get involved, especially as the costs continue to mount as the war goes on for years and years, as you expect. Okay, one more. Sure. Well, okay. Uh, thank you. Um, so. I heard a little bit about China today, and um, I think that, you know, if you kind of look in the years to come, right, you have Taiwan, which is strategic, national importance, um, especially in the, you know, tech sector, um, and China very much wants to take over Taiwan, right? China, you know, um, uh, you know, pretty much took over Hong Kong um, a couple years ago, uh, and so they're looking at Ukraine. And they're looking at what happened in Afghanistan, too. They're looking kind of at all this. And I'm just wondering, if you were President Xi right now, kind of how would you um, be taking lessons from the war in Ukraine? And um, what might they be thinking over there? OK. Ivo. Uh, let me take the reconstruction uh, uh, question. Uh, and uh, you know, it's very, it's very hard to reconstruct a country or to construct a country, to rebuild it when it is under constant attack. And so you can't really get to the fundamental uh, reconstruction of the country until at least that part that you are rebuilding is no longer uh, suffering daily, weekly uh, missile attacks. Um, uh, once, once one gets to that point, and I think hopefully we'll, we'll get to that sooner rather than later, I have, you know, the, I, the ability of the West really only the West, to provide the monetary resource to do that is clearly there. I mean, we're talking right now, what, $500 billion over 10 years? That's $50 billion uh, a, um, uh, a year to, to be paid by the West. I mean, that's peanuts when you look at it in terms of the actual, not whether politically we will do that is a completely different issue. But can we afford it? Yes. And will it pay out in, large, in, in terms of economic benefit, uh, to our Western firms, to the kind of integration that Ukraine will have economically with Europe and, and the Western world? Absolutely. Uh, problem is, will, will, can we convince our politicians to provide that kind of resources? That may be hard in, in Europe. It may be even harder in the United States. Yeah, I, I agree. I think um, the Russians essentially have a veto over whether Ukraine gets reconstructed. And, and that's a very painful thing for me to say. I'm sure it's hard for people to hear. But uh, nobody is going to sink $500 billion into reconstructing Ukraine if they believe that the next day the Russians are going to lay waste to it with artillery and long-range airstrikes and bombs and missiles. So either we... Uh, completely defeat the Russians, they sue for peace in some sort of you know, Nazi Germany or Imperial Japan sense at the end of World War II, or Russia is going to have to agree to end this war in order for Ukraine to be reconstructed. So the path toward uh, Ukrainian reconstruction really isn't an economic path. It's a, it's a political and diplomatic path. And I agree, right now it looks like we can't afford it. Now, you know, what, if the United States runs into real economic hard times, uh, 
uh, if you know, someone mentioned earlier the uh, the Chinese were aspiring to displace the dollar or at least erode its position as as the world's dominant currency were that to happen that could have some rather significant economic repercussions in the United States that in turn could make Americans uh, less than uh, enthusiastic about spending large sums of money to help other countries rather than helping ourselves. So the, the political context here is going to matter a lot. But I think that fundamental point that we're going to have to have an agreed settlement of this war for Ukraine to be reconstructed is uh, the starting point of wisdom on this. All right. Does either one of you want to step into President Xi's shoes for a minute? No, I'm happy not to. Okay. Stuart? <laughs> well, I, I see uh, Paul here, my former colleague at the CIA, uh, who is here at the Chicago Council, who is much more qualified to answer that question okay. than I am. So I'll, I'll defer to All Paul. Right. I, I'm, I have already, I'm in, in danger of getting fired because I'm, I'm already 10 minutes over our, our, but, and I think it's clear from this and from the questions I have in front of me from our online colleagues, this has been an enormously uh, rich conversation and one that could go on for several hours. So please join me in thanking Eva Dalder and George Beebe. Uh, and, and let me add a thanks to the audience because these have been terrific questions. And uh, I hope you will all join us for some libations now. Uh, and thank you.